the logical structure of arguments. Logic is a means through which one can develop ideas and recognize new ones. Before applying logic to reach conclusions, it is important to understand some important terminologies related to logic. The first term we are going to discuss is inductive reasoning. In inductive argument, a conclusion or common principle is reached by generalizing from a body of evidence. The conclusions reached through inductive reasoning are always conditional to some extent. That is, there is always the possibility that some additional evidence may be introduced to suggest different conclusions. For example, if you look out a window and observe that the street and sidewalk are wet and the sky is overcast, you will most likely conclude that it had rained recently. You didn't see the rain, but you can generalize from the past experiences with the same evidence. Given the available evidence, you were perfectly justified in concluding that it had rained. But suppose you then turn on the radio and learn that the water main in the street had broken overnight. Now you should be prepared to revise your original conclusion based upon the new information. Inductive arguments use available evidence to construct the most likely conclusion. The second term is deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is the process of applying a generalization to a series of specific cases. At the heart of a deductive argument is a major premise, a generalized belief that is assumed to be true, which the writer applies to a specific case. Provided the premises are true and the line of reasoning valid, the conclusion must necessarily be true. For example, if our major premise is that all doctors must complete residency, which is a generalized belief, and our minor premise is Mike is studying to become a doctor, which is our specific case, then the conclusion will be Mike must complete residency. We must first understand what is premise. Premise is a statement in an argument that provides reasons and or support for the conclusion. A premise is an assumption that something is true. It is a proposition used as evidence in an argument. The basic structure of an argument requires two declarative sentences or premises that help formulate a conclusion. For example, if our first premise is, all humans have the capacity for creative thought, and our second premise is that all capacities should be developed and used, then our conclusion will be that all humans should think creatively. A conclusion is a logical result of the relationship between the premises Conclusions reinforce the main claim of the argument and provide solution to the issue under consideration. The next two terms we will focus on are syllogism and enthymeme. Syllogism is a logical device that applies deductive reasoning to arrive at a conclusion based on two or more propositions that are assumed to be true. For example, reptiles do not have fur. A crocodile is a reptile. Crocodiles do not have fur. While enthymeme is an argumentative statement in which the writer or the speaker omits one of the major or minor premises, does not clearly pronounce it, or keeps the premise implied. However, the omitted premise in the enthymeme remains understandable even if it is not clearly expressed. For instance, where there is smoke, there is fire. The hidden premise, smoke causes fire. The two terms, enthymeme and syllogism, seem to be alike. However, they are not. Syllogism 
is deductive logic that contains three parts in which both premises have valid conclusions such as all reptiles are cold-blooded animals lizard is a cold-blooded animal therefore lizard is a reptile whereas enthymeme is an argumentative statement in which one of the two premises is not explicitly stated However, the unstated premise is understandable. For example, he could not have committed this terrible crime. I have known him since he was a child. The hidden premise that he is innocent by nature and therefore can never be a criminal is unstated but understandable. Classical arguments can be divided into seven parts, starting with the introduction which introduces the issue and captures the attention of your audience. Background information provides the history of the situation and stresses how things currently stand. It defines any key terms, draws attention to the specifically important points and tries to fill in any gaps between the audience's understanding. Proposition introduces the position you are taking and frames your thesis statement. Proof of confirmation gives reasons, provides facts, and shows evidence to support your claim. Refutation recognizes and disapproves the opposing point of view that you disagree with. Concession admits the opposing points you agree with and shows why the concession does not damage your own case. Conclusion summarizes your most important points and emphasizes emotional connections with your audience. Tolman's model of reasoning, also known as audience-based courtroom model, differs from formal logic. Tolman's model assumes that all assertions and assumptions are contestable by opposing counsel, and that all final verdicts about the persuasiveness of the opposing argument will be rendered by a neutral third party, a judge or jury. As writers, keeping in mind the opposing counsel forces us to anticipate counter-arguments and to question our assumptions and keeping the judge and jury in mind reminds us to answer opposing arguments fully without rancor and to present positive reasons for supporting our case as well as negative reasons for disbelieving the opposing case. Above all else, Tolman's model reminds us not to construct an argument that appeals only to those who already agree with us. In short, tailor arguments to your audience. The basic format of the Tolman model includes claim or anthony, which provides the thesis of the argument. Grounds and data include evidence gathered to support the claim. Grounds are the supporting evidence that make an audience accept your reason. Grounds are facts, data, statistics, causal links, testimony examples, anecdotes, the blood and muscle that flesh out the skeleton frame of your anthony. Warrants, also referred as a bridge, provide explanation of why or how the data supports the claim and the underlying assumption that connects the data to your claim. Warrant is the value, belief, or principle that the audience has to hold if the soundness of the argument is to be guaranteed or warranted. Backing, also referred to as the foundation of an argument, provides additional logic or reasoning that may be necessary to support the warrant. If there is a chance that the audience will question or doubt the warrant, then the writer needs to back it up by providing an argument in its support. Backing is the argument that supports the warrant. Its goal is to persuade the audience to accept the warrant. Counterclaim is a claim that negates or disagrees with the thesis or claim. 
Rebuttal provides evidence that negates or disagrees with the counterclaim. Take into consideration the resistant audience that might try to refute your argument, challenge your reason, grounds, warrant, or backing. Conditions of rebuttal remind writers to look at their arguments from the perspective of skeptics and to try addressing all those concerns before the argument is presented to its audience. Qualifications specify the limits to the claim, warrant, and backing. Qualifiers are used to limit the force of a claim and indicate the degree of its probable truth. Words such as very likely, probably, or maybe can be used to indicate the probability of the claim. Tolman defines an argument as a logical progression from data to claim based on the warrant if the warrant is controversial, additional backing has to be provided. For example, if the collected data shows that selling naming rights to buildings forces universities to focus on pleasing the sponsors rather than on education, then our claim can be that universities should not sell naming rights to buildings. And our warrant can be that education is the first priority of universities. Now, based on all the gathered information, our thesis can be universities should not sell naming rights to buildings because universities seek to promote education rather than business. They should avoid selling naming rights to buildings unless doing so supports the goal of educating students. Qualifiers such as usually, probably, should, and possible show degree of certainty of the conclusion and terms such as unless indicate exception. Before I conclude this presentation, let us go back to the classical argument slide. Classical arguments are what we will be writing throughout this semester, so familiarize yourself with this type of argument and make sure whenever you write your own paper, it has all the seven parts a classical argument is composed of. The first three parts, introduction, background, and proposition, will combine into one strong introductory paragraph in which you introduce the issue, provide background information, and try to fill in any gaps to prepare your audience to understand and relate to your argument. Then you state your clear and concise thesis statement. Your introduction should be strong and meaningful. Do not provide unnecessary, wordy, commonplace information. Within your body paragraph, once you introduce your topic and state your thesis, you will work on further developing and supporting your argumentative claim. Through proof of confirmation, you will give reasons, facts, and evidence to support your claim. Recognize and refute opposing points of view that you disagree with. Research to find the common argument that disputes your thesis and then refute that argument. Doing so makes your argument stronger. Following is an example of refutation. In this example, the counterclaim is that the production of electric vehicles on average emits more pollutants than conventional vehicles. This is largely due to the methods of fabrication of the lithium-ion batteries used in electric cars, re resulting in 15% greater emission than the production of gasoline-based vehicles. The author refutes this point by saying, When all calculations from manufacturing of the automobile to the end of its life are taken into consideration, the overall carbon imprint of an electric car is way lower than a gasoline-powered car. Just the normal operation of an electric-powered vehicle averages a 52% lower overall emission rate compared to a conventional vehicle. Notice that the author supports his claim with evidence, and this is a very important point you will all support your claims with evidence coming from reliable sources. 
to show fairness towards the issue, read both sides of the argument. And if you find an opposing point of view you agree with, discuss that within your paper, while showing how this concession does not damage your own case. For example, first you acknowledge the opposing point you agree with. There is no denying the fact that today petroleum cars are more popular and they are much easier on the pocket. However, in the long run, the environmental damage caused by gasoline-operated vehicles is way more than any dollar saved in the initial purchase. Here, the response to concession shows how this one positive point does not cover for all the negatives or how this point does not contradict or damage your claim. So although you are agreeing with one of the points made by the opposition, you are disagreeing with all other points. When negating or conceding opposition, make sure you provide an honest description of the opposing argument. Don't try to purposely weaken the opposing argument. Then conclude your argument by summarizing the most important points and emphasizing emotional connections with your audience.